Welcome to the Writer Dojo with your host, Steve Diamond. What's up? And Larry Korea. Guten Tag. This episode, Building Character. All right, everybody. Once again, welcome back to the Writer Dojo. We are very pleased to have you with us here today. Um, yet another episode where Steve is not high, unfortunately for you. Um, He's still here with his arm sling on. I, I still have the arm sling on. Um, I've been told that I have to keep it on for like five weeks. So <sighs> it's miserable and it's hot and it's miserable. If I didn't say that again, just understand it's miserable. All right. I really want us to start getting into some nuts and bolts here. And I think this is the great way to, I think this is going to be a great way to start. Most people, um, when you've decided you want to become a writer or when you decide you want to, to tell that first story, whether it's a short story or, or, or a piece of long fiction, like a novel, um, oftentimes the questions that I get asked, and, and I'm sure you get them the same way because I've been around you enough to know that you do. People always say, okay, well, where do you start? What's the best way to get into your story? Like, like what's the thing that gets you the most excited that gets you into it? So you, you want to start, um, if you're, a, if you're a plotter, like we've already discussed and you, you want to start doing that, or if you're a discovery writer, like I am, what's the thing that gets you gel that gets you jazzed and you start and you head right in. Yep. Getting started is really one of the hardest steps. And so more often than not, I find, and of course, look, like, like we say all the time, no matter what we say, there's going to be someone out there that's like, no, I do it this other way. And that's so, good for them. We, spiffy. Um, I find that there are two basic entry points. The first one being you have this great character concept idea and that's your genesis point and then you just start running. The other one is your setting, basically, your world. And that's the other point. They're both valid and, yep. and you and I have done both. Yeah, absolutely. So, and we've already, and we've already had episodes where we've talked about idea management and we've talked about plotting. So, uh, the next logical part is, you know, our building blocks, our basic yeah, foundation. Of exactly. The um, and, uh, so I guess today we're doing characters. So let's do characters. Let's yeah. start with character because for me personally, this is m more often than not, this is where I start. Having a good character idea to start with is absolutely huge because sometimes a strong enough character, you will just build the world off of their very existence. So uh, one of the things I like to say is when I'm plotting is uh, always be asking or I'm world building is always be asking. So like if this is how things are, how did they get that way? And with a character, if you have a, a character who's a certain way, why? What is it in his world that makes him be that way? And the example I'll use is uh, Ashok Vidal, okay. one of my most famous characters. Uh, he's the main guy from Son of the Black Sword. And I had him as a character before I had most of the setting or most of the plot. And uh, I've talked about where this story's come from before. It's the song Waiting from a Train from the Inception soundtrack by Hans Zimmer. Give me an idea for an action scene. So I wrote this one action scene. That I, later on wound up as the uh, knife fight, big knife fight in the first book. And um, so I had this character and uh, I started, started asking, it's like, what kind of guy is it that would just absolutely get into this fight to the death with a bunch of people over this point of honor? What kind of world would you have if you have these like, you know, uh, these brutal caste systems where this guy is an imposter, where he's a, he's in a higher caste than he should be. So that started to lay the groundwork for the whole setting. Um, and what is the nature of this man that would do this kind of thing? If he grew up this way, living a lie, and he was like perfectly dedicated to a uh, false reality, what would that do to his personality? And so I wound up with this guy who's this like uh, super hardcore, dedicated to the law, doesn't really know how to be a human being. I mean, he is he's a paladin. He's, well, I mean, he's, he's like a Judge Dredd paladin. Yeah, he's the Judge Dredd. He's lawful, lawful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's lawful. Screw you. I'll kill your face because you've broken the law, lawbreaker. Yeah. And so that, that was his personality up to this point. And so all these things came out of just, I had this powerful character that I really liked. And so I started building the entire universe around him. So the whole thing with the law replacing religion came out of that. 
the whole thing with the caste systems came out of that. Well, the whole thing with the caste systems, why did they have those? That's how I started doing the world building, the history of how that world came to be. And so the whole universe exists off the strength of this one character. You know, one of the one of the stories that I'm working on right now that that I know you're excited about is my werewolf cop story. Oh, two werewolf cops going to be awesome. Yeah. So, so that it's a. I've heard this. The, the pitch for this is great, guys. So the 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 great the, the genesis of that was a character, and it came from two very specific things. One, I was listening to um, the audiobook of Robert McCammon's The Wolf Sour, mm -hmm. which is such a cool, fun book. We've mentioned McCammon on here before. He's, he's I'm, awesome. And, and I will mention him every chance I get because he is, I'm a, I'm a super fanboy of, of McCammon's. Dude's awesome. Um, just a, an incredible writer. Anyway, I was reading The Wolf's Hour, which is, a, which is a World War II spy thriller, but the guy's a werewolf and stuff. And so it's, it's a horror novel, more or less. Um, so I was listening to that and I got home from a trip, a road trip where I was listening to it. And I started watching the show Luther. Now Luther, as Larry knows, is one of my favorite shows and it's one of his favorite shows. Great show. And Idris Elba can do no wrong. No wrong at all. Uh, now there's a line in the first season where uh, Idris Elba's character is, is up on the roof of the, of the police precinct, for lack of a better term. They, they use different words because it's British. And it's kind of that stereotypical scene where, where the cop is on the roof and he's like standing on the edge and he's looking down and, and you're like, oh man, is he thinking about, is he thinking about doing it? Is he going to jump? No, nah, he's not going to jump. He's too tough for that. You know, you know how that goes, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's super copy trope. But his partner comes up and says, John, John's the, the character's name, says, John, are you okay? What, what are you doing? And Idris Elba looks back at him and I, and I, and I, I love this line to death. And he says, do you ever wonder if you're on the devil's side and you don't even know it? And when that line was spoken, the ideas just collided in my head immediately. And I was like, holy crap, what if I do a werewolf cop? <laughs> because, because if you're a werewolf, you're a monster. And what if you're on the devil's side and you don't even know it? Holy crap, I'm going to title my book that. I love that's the, that. That's the Aha only moment. time. That's the only time that, that a title has ever come easy to me in the history of existence. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good title too. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing because it's a situation where all of a sudden now you've got this character and this character exists in your head. And then you start asking why? Yeah. Like you said earlier. Mm -hmm. Like, well, well, obviously why this is, is a werewolf? world with werewolves in it. How do I want to play that? I'm like, well, this, this has got to be urban fantasy then. Speaking of genre, as is we talked secret about. Is this werewolves or is this like... Is it open? Open werewolves? How does he get turned into a werewolf? How does it work? What are the other monsters? If there's werewolves, there's other monsters. I mean, why are why there monsters? Why, would, why are I mean, they here? Why is he a cop? Was he a cop before he was a werewolf? Uh -huh. Is he just... Dev I mean, does he want to be a cop because he is a werewolf? Yeah. What kind of... Man, what could a what kind of crimes could a werewolf cop solve? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and so cool. and so you start generating ideas. Um, you know, again, you know, we've talked about the concepts of of idea management, and and now anyone who says that they're they're lacking ideas just isn't observant to the world that they're living in, because ideas come from everywhere. We are drowning in ideas. Ideas are not the hard part. Not at all. And so. The challenge there actually was, well, holy crap, where do I even start? You know, what kind of, what would be, what would be a good first case for a, for a werewolf who, who, for a werewolf cop, who's basically a detective, what, what would be the, what would be the place to start? I don't even know. And you start thinking of these things. Yep. And, and I know, I know when you and I get together and we brainstorm, a lot of the times we're like, well, what if this what if that? Wouldn't it be we cool did that, if... We did that, what, yesterday? Was that last night? Day before yesterday. Day before yesterday, yeah. We wound up having a brainstorming session uh, for the for the book we're working on now because we were tweaking some stuff with some of the characters. And all of it all of it was character-driven. It was actually character-driven. We had a couple different characters, uh, specifically an antag two antagonist characters. One who's kind of a protagonist slash antagonist. And partway through the edits... Uh, I was looking at his motivations and I was like, mm, I think it'd be stronger if we did this and this. And I pitched it to Steve and Steve liked it. So we kind of tweaked his motivations a little bit. So we had his boss 
took on a more important role as being an antagonist antagonist. And we started brainstorming just basically why would this guy do that? What would be his possible motivation to do this incredibly evil thing? And we came up with some pretty badass stuff involving, you know, basically trafficking and ghosts and whatnot. And, you know, might as well, if, you're, if, if, you're, if you gain magical power from trafficking and ghosts, you might as well invade hell. They got tons of dead people. Yeah, right. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's interesting to me, and, 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 I, and I hope what you guys can hear is the enthusiasm that both Larry and I have for these, for these wonderful characters that we create. Um, and, and, that's, and that's really why I say that this is, for me, this is one of the, the easiest entry points into writing a story for me. Well, you can see you can see stories that came about because of a character, and you can see stories that came about because of a setting, and they stuck the characters in it. Um, like my wife right now, Bridge has not written anything, but she's got a really great, so I, I think a wonderful idea for a setting. Uh, but like mentally, she's just still kind of thinking about who she would populate it with and, and the plot and whatnot. Um, so it just kind of depends on the order you go. But if you ever see like a movie or a book that's named after a character. That tells you the character probably existed before the book, before everything else, you know. Uh, John Wick. John Wick, exactly. <laughs> the, that series is is John Wick. Um, uh, John Carter of Mars. John Carter of Mars. James Tarzan, Bond. Conan. James Bond. If the thing is called the guy, the guy is where it came from, and and it's the focus of the story. Laura Croft, Tomb Raider. You know, and, it, and you know, it's pretty interesting if, if we, um, if we kind of go a little bit further down the realm of, so we'll use kind of your, your cop drama E type stories, you know, your, your Harry Bosch's, your John Luther's. Yeah. Um, named after the guy. You there know, you go. Um, well, and, and, we, and we can go first and we can go down your main line of monster hunter. Okay. All those stories are pretty much, and, and books that kind of follow in that vein they're almost all told in first person. Uh, so Monster Hunter is about half, uh, about your, three your, quarters first person. Yeah, your, yeah. your mainline ones are first person. Yeah, the mainline ones are first person. They switch to third person yeah. for the outside ones. In in Bosch, for the most part, well, the the novels by by Michael Connelly, who's a terrific author, um, a lot of those are first person. Um, you know, most detective stories are first person. Yeah. Um, and, and and what I what I think this does is this really focuses the reader on the character it's how you, you are seeing this story through the lens of that character have we talked about first person and third person yet we haven't so we will oh we will we are okay we got to do that one <laughs> now I, I think that it's i think that it's very interesting and um i think it's very telling how interested or, or how how excited oftentimes an author can be by, by pushing it into first person. Everything, everything then becomes the story about that character, his perceptions of everything, the lens through which he's telling, he, he's, he's seeing, he or she or it or whatever is seeing that story. Um, you know, one of the things we, we often tell people when they're, when they're, um, when they're writing a story is tell the scene, write the scene from the most interesting character's point of view. And when you write in a first person, that means that every scene Had is the most be... interesting from that person's point of view. I mean, the only the only ones I can think of that aren't necessarily like that is when you hear for your point of view characters an observer type character, yeah. so like uh, Holmes and Watson. Yeah, you know. But other than that, for the most part, it's going to be yeah, that's that that point of view character is where it's at. Yeah, I I, I love this idea, and I, and I love the, and I love where we're going with this. Now we're going to take a quick break, uh, and. When we come back, we're going to delve a little bit more into some of the questions you should be asking yourself when you're starting to write a story uh, and you're using a cool character that you've come up with as your entry point. So we'll be right back and uh, enjoy this message from our sponsors and whatever. Meet Jack Bishop. A normal kid at a normal school who is shocked to discover that he has the unexpected ability to see psychic residue left behind by both murder victims and monsters. When his father is abducted from the mysterious company where he works as head of security, Jack teams up with fellow student and mind reader Alexandra to search for his father and stop the series of murders happening in his hometown before it is too late. 
Steve Diamond's debut novel, Residue, is a young adult supernatural thriller for readers looking for action, suspense, humor, and horror. Residue is available on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Pick up your copy today. All right, everyone, welcome back. Now, before we get going again on this topic of, of character building uh, as your entry point into a story, there's two people we want to thank really quick. Uh, the first one is Craig Nibo, who uh, always lets us use his awesome equipment and uh, who also wrote our, our freaking awesome funky theme song. And then uh, our other one is Jack, our web guy. And Jack, and producer, editor, producer Jack and uh... announcer, editor, producer all-around dude who has made this possible. These two guys, we owe them big time because Steve and I know how to write stuff, uh, but beyond that, we are pretty much helpless. That's right. I mean, I only have one arm, so what else can I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, he's even more helpless than usual. You can't even do accounting with one arm, man. Barely. You try working a spreadsheet with one hand. All that control shift. <laughs> So we were talking about characters when we left, and so we're going to get into the like little nuts and bolts of good character building here. All right, so let's let's start at the beginning, Larry. When when you think of of a character, well, let's let's just take Ashok then, right? We, we've talked a little bit about this. You know what? No, since we've already talked about Ashok, let's actually let's talk about Owen. Yeah. Okay. So Owen Pitt paid for my house, paid for your house, paid for Yard Moose Mountain. So when you first meet Owen, he's an accountant, okay? That, that opening scene, and this isn't a spoiler for anyone out there, so shove it. It's been out 12 years. Um, and it's the frickin' first page. So Owen is an accountant. That's the, let, let's, let's use that as the genesis point of, of, of Owen's character. Yeah. So, I, I so what, that... what's the first thing that you're gonna do to make him special? reason I made that guy an accountant was because I was, my idea was I was doing this urban fantasy where monsters are real and people hunt them in secret. I wanted to start out the protagonist character with the most mundane, stereotypically boring job a, a guy could have. So both of our careers. Exactly. We're both accountants. And the funny thing is because I did that from that moment on, everyone assumed Owen's this Mary Sue, which actually, if you know me and you know that character and, and Steve actually knows me. No, not even close. No. <laughs> no. Other than the temper and the gun nuttery, uh, I'm way more other characters in that series than I am Owen. Um, but like, so what I did with that is I, so I made him an accountant because I needed something that needed to be stereotypically boring. I actually really think accounting is fun. I loved it. Uh, I loved doing it in his career. Uh, writing is cooler though. Um, I made him a gun nut because for one massive reason, I wrote this for an audience of gun nuts. Right so, so you were cons so so your character was driven by who you wanted to market this book to. Exactly, I wrote this book inspired by internet gun nuts complaining about horror movies, and I am a gun nut in real life, and uh, so obviously for knowledge and research purposes, that enabled me to write those scenes a lot more realistically. Another one, people, it's a Mary Sue, it's a big man who does accounting and guns. Yeah, you got me totally. Yeah, it turns out there's a lot of those in this world. Yeah, totally. Actually, if you go to very many shooting classes, she's like, who's an accountant? Bruh. There's yeah. like 10 of us in each one. Um, yeah, don't mess with accountants, dude. I'm serious. That Ben Affleck movie was actually a documentary. Yeah. The most unrealistic part of that movie was the accounting. <laughs> yeah. It was so bad. It really was. It was The auditing was horrible. Um, but anyway, so I took this character, and that was his basic skill sets, and I started building his personality. I made him a snarky smartass. Why? Because I'm writing in first person. And if you have, if you're writing in first person and your character's funny, you get to introduce more humor into the thing, which makes it fun. Well, and if, and if you're doing first person and your character is super boring, how, how are you getting your reader to, to turn yeah, the next that, page? That's just like, that's a challenge. So don't set yourself up for failure. I mean, you can, if you have the skills, write a first person point of view character who is boring. However, he needs to have some fun stuff going on around him. Yeah. Um, so I started out with that, and uh, so building this character, I needed to give him an interesting background. Also, a background that would explain how he could, as a regular dude, survive these super violent altercations. So I gave him a very violent background. He came from uh, uh, not not a not a bad upbringing, but a harsh upbringing, mm -hmm. uh, with a with a dad who was like an end of the world survivalist kind of guy, uh, Green Beret, and. 
uh, hardcore, and I set him up for that. Um, I made him a fighter. Why did I make him a fighter? Not because I, because I wasn't very good at it. Owen was stupendously good at it. I was terrible. I got choked out a lot. Okay, I was bad. I'm a terrible wrestler. Uh, Owen was really good. Why? Because I'm writing a series of action books where the guy needs to be big and tough and strong and able to fight his way through a bunch of stuff. So it kind of, that set the thing, but it also enabled me to give him some interesting personality quirks and just kind of ran with it from there. And he's a really popular character because he's fun. And I got to beat the crap out of him now for 12 years. Well, and, and the interesting thing about this is all of that, and, and a lot of this, it's not mentioned explicitly within the first chapter of the book. Um, however, a lot of it is implied based upon his actions. Oh, well, yeah. You don't want to now, dump too much character right at front. Right. Now, the interesting thing, and and again, this isn't a spoiler. It's on page like, actually, it's the very first sentence of the book. So if this is a spoiler to you, just go away. Um, don't cry to me. <laughs> so Owen's boss turns into a werewolf and tries to attack him. Right? Yep. That, that, that's the opening scene. Yep. And, and Owen throws him out a window. So, right from the get-go, you've established, one, monsters are real. Two, Owen is good and can hold his own against a werewolf. And, and then, uh, and he gets, he gets hurt from this encounter. And that leads into him being basically put under observation. And they're like, well, okay, we're going to... Another if you turn, we're going to kill you in the face. Another thing too, people don't realize in the opening there too, is the way he conveys the information is a little ironic and a little silly and a little mm -hmm. fun, and which also kind of helps set the stage as to the nature of this character. So and he, that's and that's all in the first chapter. Yeah, it's not going to you. So you know, it's not going to be a bleak book. No. Uh, the Monster Hunter series is not bleak because part of the thing was I wanted to do all the horror tropes, but I wasn't writing a horror novel. I was writing an action novel. Yeah. Um, and this all came about because, again, I was on the internet with a bunch of gun nuts, and we used to joke that, you know, regular people scream and run and get eaten, but if a horror movie starred gun nuts, it'd be over in, like, three minutes. Oh, no, he's coming right at me. Bam! And it's, you know, movie over, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's where that came from. And so that, I designed that character specifically to appeal to that market. So so what I hope all you all are, are, are hearing as we're describing this I'm trying very hard here to to ask specific questions, and Larry's trying really hard to answer them in a very specific way. And that's, this isn't just, ooh, yay character. It's, it, it's purpose-driven. Yeah, I would say purpose-driven is a good way to look at it. Um, as you introduce different characters, they're going to serve different purposes. And they, they've got to be characters you're enthusiastic about. And they're also characters you can use to build your world. Well, remember, these books are... Well, so the first Monster Hunter is almost 180,000 words? Oh, it's close to 200. Is it's it almost 200? It's too long. If I, it's the one thing, if I could go back in time to my you, first book, I would... You'd I cut would, a few? I don't know if I'd cut much, but I definitely could clean it up. I, but that's just practice. You know, and, and, and if, I, if I point out to our, to our book, Servants of War, which we haven't, which we haven't obviously released yet... Um, Look, you're you're writing these characters for 150, 200,000 words. You if you are like an enthusiastic them. and you don't like these characters, oh yeah, what the heck are you doing? You're you, going to get bored out of your mind and you're going to stop writing. You know, characters evolve too. So you got you got characters when you start like so. Gun Runner that I did with John Brown was a book where they actually we had plot and setting more than we had characters going. We had some basic character archetypes. We kind of went with the five man band trope. Yeah, sure. You know, leader, lancer, big guy, girl, nerd, or yeah. whatever, whatever it is. I can't remember. And uh, so we started out with that, but then it kind of evolved over time as we worked on it. And uh, then John did the rough draft. One of the things I did in the rough draft is I just felt like the book would be better. Because we first were writing this, the main character was like probably in his 30s. He was a pretty mature guy. I bumped him down so he was in his early 20s. Uh, because that changed a few. If you read Gunrunner, Jackson... Um, as a young guy, it made him more vulnerable. It made him more inexperienced. Some of the decisions he made in the plot made more sense coming from a guy in his 20s than it did coming from a mature guy in his 30s. Right. You know? So characters, can, you can have a great character going in, and they can still evolve as you go to tell your story better. Yeah, I I think... Well, that's one thing, too. Like, over Monster Hunter, Owen's aged... Oh, right. Yeah, he's aged over this series. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I my one regret or one other regret on the first book because I, I I put one single date. I pinned one date, oh. one year, and that was a mistake. And I wish I I could undo that, but I can't. And so people are trying to like pick what year this actually is taking place. Doesn't I'm matter. just hand waving it. But over the series, over the over this book, over the series, the man has clearly aged. He's clearly matured. He's had a lot of things happen well, to him. He got married. He had a kid. Yep. I mean, he, characters change. Oh, I, he's lost loved ones. Uh, the nature of his family has changed. He's had ups, downs, failures. Uh, people have died because of decisions that he's made. You know, so you grow your characters organically as the series goes on. An unchanging character is kind of boring. Well, and, and I, I think that that's why so many people have qualms with a character like Superman. Yeah, he, and it, takes too, a good, he, it takes a good writer to, yeah. to, to make good stuff with Superman. Because the majority of the writers that we see out there doing Superman, um, uh, aside from the fact that um, DC doesn't make good comics anymore, is uh, their Superman is so static. It's they look at him and they're like, oh, well, he's Superman. He I mean, he's Superman. I mean, in, in literal terms, it means he's like the best man. It's one of those out there. That's one of those challenges about IP writing is when you're messing with somebody else's characters. Uh, we've both done some IP we writing. Have. And it's a real challenge because there are certain things set in stone that you as the creator just aren't allowed to mess with. And for good reason, because they have to protect their property. And sometimes if you get a really disrespectful writer out there who doesn't respect the property, especially in comic books. Holy so crap. all of DC and Marvel right now. Yeah. They just roll in and they just poop all over the legacy of that character yeah. and... I'm sorry, they subvert expectations. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, subverting expectations is great when you are the artist and you are legit doing that and having fun and the readers like it. But when you're doing it just to be a douchebag and be like, ha ha, I made a terrible movie when you expected a good one. I'm so clever. Looking at you, Ryan Johnson. Yeah, looking right at you. <laughs> I hate that movie. We could do a whole episode of me just ranting about uh, Last Jedi. <laughs> now it's... Maybe we uh, should. <laughs> maybe we should talk about all the all the bad movies you we and should, I have watched we together. We should talk about like bad storytelling decisions one episode. You and I will just read read the review of Prometheus together. Oh. Um, <laughs> Idris Elba's Captain's Log. Oh, poor Idris Elba. Early when we when we said Idris Elba can do no wrong, he didn't do any wrong. He he's great. He's in some really bad movies. That poor but it's man. Not his fault. That poor man. Now one of the. I think one of the best ways to tackle this, is, and, and I do this with my characters, um, and that's, yeah, you know, I, I, I tend to always think in terms of, of why they're awesome and why I like them so much, right? So one of the side characters in my book, Residue, is, her name is Alex. Great character. She's, she's basically just, she's a, you know, a young girl, a young teenager, um, 16, 17 in the first book, and she can read minds. She's a gun nut. Um, she shoots first and doesn't even bother to ask questions later. Great character. But I didn't want her to fall into the trap of the whole Superman thing. Okay. And I, and, and so I went two ways with her mind reading, quote unquote, superpower in this supernatural thriller slash maybe a horror novel, depending on who you are. And that is, I said, okay, the, the cliche with mind reading that you see everywhere is that, oh, if you can hear everyone's thoughts, it's so loud and blah, blah, blah. That's stupid to me. Because like any other sense, you get to know. It's not like you walk outside and you're like, oh, no, I, I see too much. Unless you're on a cruise ship and everyone's in a Speedo. Right? That's the only time that you're like, I've seen too much. This is too much to bear. So I went in with the attitude of, no, no, no. She would have developed this as a sense. And so she would use it to cheat the ever living crap out of everything that she's doing in school. I remember that. I remember as a character reading that as she's immediately using her mind powers to cheat yeah. on a test. Yeah. Because she doesn't feel like studying because that's stupid when you can read Why bother? Minds. Why bother when, when, when there's better things to do like learning how to kill monsters? And better. she's like, what's the smart kids say? Okay, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> but I also was like, you know what? Like most things, they're, they're multi-dimensional. They're, multi they're multifaceted. And I said, now... I need to give her a weakness. Now, if you can read everyone's thoughts, you're going to have severe trust issues Absolutely. because everybody lies. And so I play that up. 
And I play it up intentionally in the beginning because I know by the end of the third book, I want her to have partially overcome this. This is part of her character arc. It's, it's learning how, how as an individual, she can overcome her weaknesses. And, and I know that with Owen, you do similar things. It's, it's him growing and becoming better and becoming, I don't want to say more trusting, but trusting in, in specific individuals. Well, it's all about, it's all about presenting challenges to the character with growth and you can't have them succeed all the time and you can't have them be good at everything. You have to have parts where they screw up, they fail, they, they struggle, they, they have to rise to the occasion, they have to push themselves because that's human. And people want to read about these characters and there's different levels to that. Like, you know, some characters are obviously going to be super good at some things, but don't make them good at everything because no. that's not human. And it's not fun either. No. Then you get Ray as a Skywalker. Yeah. Jedi, as a Palpatine. As a horror, as a horror author, I like putting characters who maybe are good in one thing and making it so that doesn't mean anything to them anymore. That's how I GM role-playing games, Absolutely. as you know. As I know. Yeah, because it's like, oh, what's your dump stat? <laughs> yeah, you're we're not going to get to roll that ever. Yeah, we're going to see how this goes for you. <laughs> All right, so so we're going to end it here, but uh, here's what I want to end with. I want to end with a little challenge to all of you listeners out there. And that is, whether, you, whether you're going to write this story or not, I don't care. I hope you do. We, we, we both hope that you, that all of you who are listening to this will, will take the time and, and actually, you know, try to flex, flex a little bit and try to write some stuff. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to just create characters. I don't give a crap what they're for. I don't give a crap if, what, what setting you want to put them in. I don't, give a, I don't give a crap what genre you want to put them in. But I want you to create some characters and ask a lot of these same questions that Larry and I have been asking each other during this session. And that's, why is he, why is he or she like this? What are his strengths? What are his weaknesses? How does that influence the world around him? And I bet as this process goes on, they will discover that they have a world for this character. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's all we're going to talk about for this session. So thank you all very much. And uh, we'll catch you on the next time. Writer Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Correa. Produced by Jack Wilder and Baron Hare Studios. Theme song, Word Mercenaries by Craig Naibo. New episodes come out every Wednesday, wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo by leaving us a five star rating or review and by helping to spread the word all questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com no -uh, i do it this other way <laughs> <laughs>